Welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast, your number one resource for inspiration and motivation to live your purpose, make healthy living a priority, and thrive doing what you love. I'm your host, Koya Webb, a small town girl who chased her dreams and caught them, a former track and field athlete who healed using spirituality and yoga, and an entrepreneur who didn't let sexual assault racism and insecurities dim her light. And now it's your turn to allow these episodes with some of the top voices in spirituality, wellness, and entrepreneurship to inspire you to thrive. Let's get loved up together. Moby is a musician, entrepreneur, activist, and philanthropist who is informally known as the godfather of veganism. His album Play sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. He's released 14 solo albums in total. A serial side hustler, Moby opened the vegan restaurant Tiani in New York City in 2002 and is the original owner of Little Pine, a unique contemporary vegan restaurant in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles. Moby, thank you so much for coming on the Get Loved Up podcast. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to see you uh, I mean, sad that it's not in person, but I guess that's the consequence of living in the apocalypse. I know. It, it's it's so interesting. I mean, the last time we saw each other in person, though, it was so beautiful. We were both at this activist event downtown, and it was so great to really spend some time because I've been to your restaurant. And, but to see you in person and to really get to talk to you and just to hear your passion from your mouth, it was it was really a beautiful time. Oh, well, thanks. And I should mention one thing. So Little Pine, um, I'm no longer the owner of Little Pine. Mm, Okay, good. So do you want to start there? Do you want to start? I mean, because that was one of your your babies. And can you talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about your your journey? Um, Well, first, starting off just what your passion for veganism, I think we can start there and then we can go into the restaurant. Yeah, I mean, I've been a vegan now for 34 years. Uh, my my vegan anniversary date is November 1987. Mm. And like most people, I grew up with that weird paradox of loving animals, but also loving eating animals. You know, like when I was a suburban teenager, I loved all of our rescued animals, but I also loved going to Burger King. And then when I was 19, uh, I had the realization that it was simply inconsistent to love animals and engage in a process that caused their suffering and death. So I went vegetarian when I was 19 in 1984. And then a few years later in 1987, finally went vegan. Wow. That is so, so amazing. I don't know. A lot of people haven't even thought, haven't been born that long that are listening to this podcast. (laughs) And so it's so amazing. And can you share some of the reasons what really inspired you? Um, You know, because I, like you, I'm Southern girl from Tennessee. So I definitely started loving animals and eating animals. So what really inspired you um, to make that transition? Well, the main thing was the connection I had with the rescued animals in my house when I was growing up, you know, I loved our rescued animals more than I loved people, you know, our dogs, we had, there were dogs, cats, lab rats, mice, gerbils, guinea pigs, lizards. And I loved these animals. And whenever I'd go out into the wild, I'd see animals and I'd be fascinated with them. I would love them. And then, as I said, when I was 19, just that simple realization that like, oh, animals have their own lives, their own rights, their own wills, their own desire to be happy, their desire to avoid pain and suffering. And I realized that that was true for all of the rescued animals in our house. And by extension, it was true for every animal on the planet. And just some part of me it was almost like a form of logical ethics where I was just like, Oh, if I recognize that these sentient individuals have their own lives and their own desire to avoid pain and suffering, it is profoundly unethical for me to be involved in anything that would cause or contribute to their suffering. So that's really 
the core of my veganism and animal rights. And of course, there are health issues that, you know, support veganism and animal rights. And forgive me, I'm stating the obvious, but there are environmental reasons. Um, there are social justice reasons. You know, there's so many reasons why simply we should live in a world where we don't use animals for food. Right. And you say you're stating the obvious, but it's actually still not obvious, even with all the information out there to a lot of people. So thank you so much for stating it. And, you know, our pillars would get loved up are spirituality, wellness and entrepreneurship. And, you know, I don't know what you subscribe to spiritually, but it almost seems like just energetically that feeling, as you said, that natural ethics of compassion is really what started your journey. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that that energy um, and what you believe spiritually and how that leads you to the decisions that you make in your life today? Yeah, I mean, in the course of my life, I've practiced a lot of different types of spirituality. Uh, when I was in high school, I had a huge crush on a woman who was a Taoist, so I became a Taoist to impress her. Um, I had a weird period of being quite a serious Christian and then being an atheist. Um, I was into Sufism for a little while. I've been, I, I've sort of experimented with a lot of different types of spirituality. And ultimately I think of myself, like if I had to describe my spiritual belief in a very succinct, simple way, it would be, the third step of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I mean by that is the third step of Alcoholics Anonymous says, turned our life and our will over to the care of God as we understood God. And when I got sober, I really wrestled with this step because I was like, like the God of my understanding. And I kept coming up with this idea. I was like, I don't have a God that I understand. Mm. And in that moment, I realized, oh, that's, that's my spirituality in a nutshell. I am fascinated by God or spirit or whatever we want to call it with the understanding. I don't understand it, mm -hmm. you know? And when I look at the universe, that's, you know, 15 billion years old and vast beyond my understanding, there's no way I could understand spirit. There's no way I could understand divinity, for lack of a better word, that's 15 billion years old and capable of creating life and capable of doing all these things. So my spirituality is a humble, I'd say a humble pursuit of that spirit without understanding really what that spirit is. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, because I think within our journey, you know, there's been so much, um, there's so much information out there when it comes to spirituality and it is a personal journey. So thanks for sharing your personal journey. And my goal with asking all my guests about their spiritual journey is the fact so people feel safe to believe what they believe and not feel judged or not feel less than or othered because they might believe, think, or move in a different way. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, with that, like you said, you had this, this natural inclination to go vegan. And I'm looking at you and I want to know like every tattoo that you have, but specifically the ones you have on your neck. And for those of you who are not looking at this on YouTube, you have to go to YouTube so that you can see. But I would love for you to share about, you know, your tattoos and what they mean to you and what was the inspiration behind them? Well, so let me think. And it's actually one of the things when the pandemic started that kind of stopped my process of getting all of these tattoos. Uh, so on my neck, on one side of my neck, it says vegan for life. And on the other side, it says, protect the innocent and defend the vulnerable. Um, and I also have a vegan straight edge tattoo by my eye. Uh, on the back of my neck, I have a cross and it says, thou shalt not kill. And then on my arms, I have big animal rights tattoos. So, uh, and really I started getting all of these tattoos when I turned 54, which might seem strange. Like most people get tattoos when they're teenagers or in their twenties. And I started when I was 54, which is 
definitely a weird time to start covering yourself with tattoos. But I thought to myself, well, I don't have a real job. Like, it's not like I'm in danger of being fired for having face tattoos. And my belief, my belief in animal rights is something I've had. It's defined me for such a long time that I'd kind of like to advertise it, you know, because by advertising it, people ask me questions and it's a way to start talking about animal rights with people. I love that. I love that. And I, it's so funny because I have zero tattoos. I can't imagine getting any, but if I did, it would probably be later on in life. And what do you feel like? Cause you know, I want to talk about the restaurants a little bit. What inspired you to start your, your first restaurant? And, you, and I know it's not easy. And again, a big part of this community is about entrepreneurship. And can you share a little bit about that journey? Um, well, just beyond just the veganism, but actually opening a restaurant. Yeah. I mean, I've opened two restaurants now. I had one in New York. It was called Teeny. It was a vegan restaurant. And then I had Little Pine. Uh, and of course, I now long, no longer own either. But really, both were inspired. They're sort of like entrepreneurial activism or activist entrepreneurialism, however you want to look at it. <laughs> and the idea was in advancing the issue to the causes of veganism and animal rights, as we know, there are movies, there are products, there are podcasts, there are social media posts, there are books, but there's also food and there's environments. And as we know, vegan restaurants can be such an amazing way of representing veganism. And so when I opened Teeny in New York 20, some odd, 20 years ago and opened Little Pine here, the idea was simply to represent veganism through the power of attraction, you know, to have like a beautiful environment where non-vegans and vegans could come and the non-vegans would be sort of impressed with the quality of the environment and the quality of the food. Uh, I eventually, you know, ended my involvement where my, I, I, sold Little Pine to see these other people. I lost money, but that's fine because I love not owning a restaurant, you know, so because <laughs> owning and running a restaurant, it can be so gratifying, but it is, I can say this, the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, it's, it's so stressful. And I just realized as time passed, like, as much as I love representing veganism through owning a restaurant, it was just taking up too much time and too many resources. And so I decided to move on. Right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And it is, and I think that's important for people to know, like, you know, entrepreneurship is never easy, but I love that you said it was your cause. You're still, perpetuating the cause of like making an impact when it comes to your activism with veganism. And, you know, I love that it's not always going to be your favorite thing to do. Like you say, you did it. It was hard and you choose, you know, I mean, you have so much music out there um, that's impacting lives. So I love to talk a little bit about your, your music as well. Like what really inspires your music and, and what is your goal and intention with your music? Well, it's such an interesting question because my relationship to music on one hand, it's never changed, but on the other hand, it's changed completely. And what I mean by that is I fell in love with music when I was three years old and I've never not been in love with music. You know, I've never fallen out of love with music. Um, but when I started making music or started making records in the nineties, and I started having some success, I did get caught up in the world of musical samsara, you know, the world of like red carpet events and fame. And in my case, like drinking and doing drugs and constant touring. And, and I got really caught up in that and I lost myself, you know, like I, you know, my, I never ever for a second, compromised my veganism, but I did compromise almost everything else. And then about 13 or 14 years ago, when I got sober, I had to sort of reconsider like, 
my music career because I, at that point, I didn't care about fame anymore. I didn't care about trying to make money from it, but I was like, I still want to make music. I just don't want to be caught up in the career aspect of it. And around that time, I started working with this organization in New York called the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. Uh, it was started by Oliver Sacks, who was a neuroscientist. And through that, I came to, I had developed this even deeper love and appreciation for music because I started to see it as a genuine healing modality. Uh, there was a movie made called Alive Inside, which is sort of about the healing power of music. And if you haven't seen it, it's really worth watching. And this is where we start to get into the more esoteric realm, which I'm sure that's, that's a space that you're very comfortable discussing. Um, <laughs> so what I realized at some point, 10 or 15 years ago, and it might sound weird, but it's the actual literal truth, is that music has technically never existed. Mm. And what I mean in a very literal sense, music is just air moving a little bit differently. You know, when, when you listen to music, all we're hearing is the air molecules in the room hitting our eardrum a little bit differently. So nothing technically, literally, nothing has ever been created around music. It's just moving these air molecules. And in that, when I realized that, I suddenly thought, oh, this is why music is such a phenomenal form of spiritual expression because it's air molecules moving a little bit differently, but in that process, it can make us cry, it can make us laugh, it can make us dance, it can make us travel across the country to jump up and down in a field with a bunch of other people. Like, <laughs> and ultimately, it's just air molecules moving a little bit differently. And that, so like, basically, I've, I'm, as in love with music as I ever have been, but now I see it as being a spiritual practice and not really a commercial one. I'm so glad you said that. And I, I definitely agree that music, it, it can change someone so much. And I love, I love your new philosophy because a lot of times we're not conscious on how music is affecting our day to day, especially in the, in the current age, we're just listening to it because it has a good beat, but we don't understand the programming of it. So can you share a bit about what you feel like, you know, the programming of music and how it's affecting our culture? Well, it's a tricky thing for me to talk about because it's very easy for me to complain about it a little bit. And what I mean by that is, and the reason I'm a little wary of, complaining is I'm, I'm a 56 year old guy and like 56 year old guys, like we're really good at complaining. Um, so, but what I will say is I was just recently looking at like pop charts from now, as opposed to 1970, mm -hmm. you know, and in 1970, it was John Lennon, Marvin Gaye, um, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, uh, Tina Turner or Aretha Franklin. Like it was this, these amazing artists. And now it's not, you know, like now it's, it's, dis it's so much more disposable. And I will say my biggest criticism is that I feel like music for the longest time was something that people really paid attention to. And now I do sadly think for a lot, especially like a lot of younger people, music is the soundtrack to TikTok. It's the soundtrack to, you know, like playing Fortnite while you're DMing your friends. Like it's, it's a background thing. And it makes me sad that, that the power of music has sort of been compromised. You know, like a lot of pop music, it's just so disposable and the subject matter is so trite. So I know on one hand, I don't know if anyone should listen to a 56 year old guy complain about music, but <laughs> I do 
it makes me sad that like, you know, 50 years ago, people were talking about let it be and imagine. And now they're talking about, I don't want to get in trouble by naming names, but now they're talking about whatever the pop hits are today, which are just so banal. Mm -hmm. I think it's a reflection of the culture, you know, and I'm glad you said that because, you know, we've always gone through what we've gone through. Right. But it's about how are we talking about what we're going through? Right. And I feel like that's the conversation. Like, how are we talking about what we're going through? Right. And it's like, are we just saying, oh, well, this is just how it is. And, you know, it's so terrible that I'm just going to make light of it. You know, and I feel like there's a lot of covering up happening um, when it comes to um, today's culture versus the past culture. Because like we're all talking about relationships and breakups and cheating and doing all the things, drugs, money, rock and roll, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. But I do think there's a different relationship to it now that has become, you know, something that we need to discuss, you know, so I'm glad you bring it up. And I don't think it's just you. Um, I think it's something that needs to be discussed because it's a pain there. It's a deep pain and it's always been a deep pain. And that's what makes music so relatable. But how are we relating to our pain? I mean, that's what I think. Oh, it just gave me chills. Like, I mean, that's what I feel like we're seeing in the music. We're literally seeing reality of how we're relating to our pain. But I love the point that you make. We're not even discussing, okay, like how are we relating to our pain and is it different than it used to be and how can we look into that? We're like, it's high, it's it's poppy. It's like, so let's, you know, people are almost like not even paying attention to that part of it. So I do think it's a discussion and I'm glad, it, you know, I didn't even plan for us to go that deep, you know, on the podcast, you know, when it, but I feel like it's such a discussion that we should talk about. Like, how are we relating to our pain? How are we relating to our trauma? And is trauma so deep now it's becoming normalized? Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I do think there is, like on one hand, I love social media because it enables us to like show really inspiring images around animal rights activism, around veganism. It enables people to connect. But it also is so quick and disposable and performative, you know. And so as a result, by definition, there's so much content that shows up for a second and it disappears and it doesn't lead to depth, Mm -hmm. you know. So like regarding addressing pain, whether it's collective pain, whether it's racial pain, whether it's gender pain, whether it's individual pain, like it tends to be dealt with in very quick, dramatic ways. You know, like the fact that like people are expressing what should be nuanced, deep emotions in 140 characters on a tweet, you know, like that's not how you ideally should be addressing the depth and subtlety of the human experience. You know, like you can't, take all those types of pain we just described, you can't take them and deal with them in a meaningful way with a post on social media, you know, like, but that's, that's the only way that people seem to communicate now. And so it's, it's, it's doing a great disservice simply to us, I think, you know, like, and people wonder why they feel so fragmented and why they're so depressed and why they're so angry all the time. It's like, well, because we're not taking quick snapshots of the human condition is not dealing with the human condition. Mm. Oh, that's so deep. That's so deep. And when you just said that about Twitter, I'm just like, okay, well, we're talking about our pain and then we're summarizing it, but we're sharing it. Right. Right. But it's almost in like what you mentioned about like the collective trauma is like not being addressed, you know, because it's like back in the day, it's like we also went through pain, but it wasn't addressed. But now it's being addressed in a massive way. But it's like, what are we doing with it? Yeah, it's being addressed in 140 characters. It's being addressed in a 24 hour (laughs) news cycle where the like one minute everyone's 
super focused on George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, two seconds later, everyone's moved on. You know, one minute, everyone's focused on climate change. Two seconds later, everyone has moved on. One minute, everyone's focused on gun violence. Two seconds later, everyone's dropped it and move on. It's like, where's the depth? Where's the meaning? Like, when you have millions of people tweeting about something and then moving on instantly, like, nothing's been resolved. Nothing's actually been dealt with in a meaningful way. And I think we all know that collectively, but we don't, but we're all, and I am just as guilty of it. We're all caught up in this like constant cycle of like peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, you know, post something, deal with the fallout, post something, deal with the fallout. But it's not like there's something to be said for like slow, methodical work on issues, not just 140 characters that express anger and then you move on. Mm, I love that. What I'm hearing is just like, we got to process this pain. We got to process this pain. Do you have anything that you're doing? Because, uh, you know, our first pillar is spirituality. Um, but the second one is well-being. Like, I would love to hear what you do to kind of process your pain and, and, and promote your own well-being. And then what you think that we can do as a community to help process our, our collective pain. Yeah, I mean, my... I think my process, first and foremost, and I think you'll appreciate this, is I try to take care of my body because years of abusing myself made me realize that, like, my emotional state is so tied to my physical state. And so I do the very obvious things, you know. I I try to eat, you know, I eat an organic, whole foods, vegan diet, Um I try to exercise and do yoga almost every day. I try to sleep well. I try to avoid caffeine and white sugar. You know, the the basic stuff, because if you have an unhealthy body, you're never going to have a healthy mind. Like, I just, I don't think, I don't think the mind can transcend lack of health and well-being. And so, and then the next thing I do is because I know myself relatively well, is I try to spend as much time as possible in environments that are healthy. And for me, that's nature. Mm. You know, like if, and I, if I'm angry at the news or if I'm angry at Twitter or if I'm angry at whatever, I put down my phone and I go for a hike and within five minutes, everything's so much better. So like grounding myself in nature, And then a huge part of my spiritual practice comes from a realization. um, I was doing an interview years ago, and one of the questions in the interview was, do I have any regrets and what would I change about my past? And my immediate thought was like, oh, I would change all these different things. But then I realized I'm so grateful for the perspective that I have and the perspective that I have is the product of all of my experiences, even the terrible ones. And so it, it gave me as almost a sense of appreciation and gratitude for everything, even the, the horrible stuff, the terrible stuff. It's given me this sort of appreciation because I don't know about you or anyone listening, but like I've learned or everyone listening, I've learned more from struggle and from, from, you know, from bad things than I have from good things. So I don't like the struggle. I don't like the bad things, but they're so educational. Right. Well, that's so powerful. That's so powerful because it's like, I love saying, you know, that saying you, you grow through what you go through, you know, Mm -hmm. and the more you've gone through, the more you have that growth that you never lose, you never forget. And it's something that I remind myself when I start, you know, kind of, feeling like the victim and feeling overcome by some of my struggle, I remind myself I'm growing, I'm evolving, I'm resilient. And I think that's something really important because a lot of people are struggling right now, especially with mental health. And I think, like you said, getting out in nature, taking care of yourself, taking care of your body is so important. Um, And another fact that I I think, you know, we didn't touch on and I want to touch on because, you know, you know, we as consumers are are making the music and we as artists 
and, you know, people online, we, we are creating this content, but also there's a system that is manipulating us based on our emotions. And I think that has to be discussed. I remember, you know, looking at uh, what was that documentary? Um, a social dilemma. And I'm like, Oh yeah. my goodness, like I'm part of the problem. And how can I be a part of the solution in this transaction that is literally set up um, to, to play on our pain, you know? And so I try to, really promote and share like the reality of life ain't always perfect. And it's not just about what's in these squares. And, you know, that's one, one reason I love having the podcast and having people from different backgrounds on the podcast so we can get a perspective that is beyond a box or a tweet or algorithm really learn people's lives because it, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's so quick and it's so, so dramatic, but I just had to acknowledge that because I feel like when that is happening, when you are being manipulated, um, you know, and people are learning your human, um, your human, I guess, uh, patterns and using those things to, you know, capitalize off of them, it, it, it's hard, you know, it's hard to outsmart a machine that's basically built <laughs> to make you act in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I, that movie, The Social Dilemma, that definitely, it affected me. Everyone I know who watched it was so depressed afterwards. Yeah. To realize absolutely, like, the world and the people in it are being torn apart by these algorithms. Because as you said, the algorithms basically prioritize anger and conflict and division and hostility. Like everything bad in the world is supported by these terrible algorithms. And, but I know a lot of people after seeing that movie, they just gave up on social media completely. I see social media as we sort of talked about earlier, like, there's so much potential for good there. And especially me being an animal rights activist, like my first question for social media is always very simply, am I helping animals? You know, like if it was up to me, I would only post animal rights content. I have to occasionally post other things, but um, I have to ask myself like, if I'm being angry on social media, if I'm being divisive on social media, it makes me feel good in the minute, but like, am I helping animals? Am I, am I representing my spiritual beliefs? You know, am I living in accordance with my beliefs? Cause I don't know about you, but I have been very, well, I'm, I'm assuming this, I'm only speaking for myself, but I've been very guilty in the past of having spiritual beliefs that at times were not represented in my actions or my words or my thoughts. And I've sort of realized like, oh, well, what's the point of having spiritual beliefs if they're not going to be a part of your life? And like, I can't call myself a good person if I'm going out into the world and hating people. You know, I can't think of myself as a good person if every time I'm in traffic, I want to cut people's heads off. Like it's remembering to integrate my spiritual beliefs in my day-to-day -day life. I guess some, you know, that would be the sort of like the Dharma of it. Right. Oh, I think that's so, I think that's so powerful because it's like, that's what I learned in my spiritual practice too. You have to practice what you preach. You have to walk the walk, you know, and it's, it's not always easy, especially when that walk is so different. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to just kind of dig a little bit deep into what has helped you along your journey. Cause I know you mentioned, you know, you're sober and you went to AA. I know a lot of people out there are struggling um, with alcohol right now. So if you can share a little bit about that journey and just help that person, that's just like, man, I just can't put down the bottle. Like, um, you know, things are so hard right now. Oh yeah. I mean, it's safe to say that almost everybody is involved in some form of addiction. Uh, some of the addiction might be a little easier to recognize. You know, obviously, like in my case, I was an alcoholic and I was spending a couple hundred dollars a day on cocaine. Like 
that's pretty easy to recognize, you know, like when you're sleeping until 5 p.m. every day and every time you wake up, you wish you had died in your sleep. Like that's an indication that there's a problem. But other types of addiction, you know, social media addiction, um, overeating, overspending, like there's so many addictions and some of them are a lot harder to recognize. Uh, as strange as this might sound, one of the things I'm most grateful for is that I so completely bottomed out as an alcoholic and a drug addict. Like there are a lot of people who can live in a state of addiction for a long time and it tears them apart slowly. Like I'm really glad that, you know, I completely physically, spiritually, emotionally bottomed out and I had to get sober. Um, I'm again, going back to the idea of being grateful for adversity and I guess it's tricky if I was to talk to people who are maybe wrestling with addiction, whether it's alcohol, drugs, social media, whatever they're addicted to. Um, I guess the advice or the suggestion I would have first and foremost is to get rid of any concept of shame because one of the things I learned in sobriety is whatever I was ashamed of, everyone else has done and is doing. Like whatever, if so whoever's listening, like if you're ashamed of something, trust me, everybody's doing the exact same thing. And if you talk to people and they're willing to be honest, there's nothing you've done that other people haven't done. And it's probably what they've done is probably worse. So like getting rid of that sense of shame and just being willing to communicate honestly, you know, like there's a, there's an expression in 12 step programs, which is we are only as sick as our secrets, you know, that, that willingness to be honest with ourselves, honest with other people and honest with whoever, whatever God might be. Um, that would be my advice, you know, to just communicate honestly and try to not be ashamed. Oh, that hit me right in the heart for real. Like, I, I think that can apply in so many instances. I feel like, you know, there's so much judgment, especially, you know, based on social media and media in general. And we hold a heavy mirror to ourselves. But I think, wow, that removing the shame and realizing there is nothing to be ashamed about. And then the second part of that, like, I just want to echo communicate, being willing to communicate. And I, th I think that is part of the solution that you you mentioned that we kind of got to in, in, in the beginning about like the pain, like how do we process the pain, you know, communication. Like I think what you said is, is, is the start to that is being willing to authentically say, I'm not okay. And this hurts and this yeah. is painful. And then us collectively okay, what are we going to do about this pain? What are we going to do about that? And I don't think that's ever really been done, you know, for us. I, th I think first it starts individually and then, you know, within our small communities and then on the world level, looking at the pain and deciding, you know, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, and it's different. It's different for everybody, but like, I don't know. I mean, we are, we're, we're in a, and I feel like I'm stating the obvious, so I, I please forgive me if I'm completely stating the obvious, but we're at such a transitional period. And I don't want to be overly dramatic, but like we are at this point individually and collectively, if we don't figure things out, we might destroy the only home that we have. Like with the climate emergency, you know, in future pandemics, like, we're dealing with like, like the world is almost saying to us, like, if you don't figure this out, you'll probably collectively not be here much longer. And, and I feel like it's, it's so hard finding honesty, you know, finding the examples of honesty because everybody, you know, like, especially on media and I'm just as guilty of this as everybody's like, we all want to be seen in a certain light. Like we all want to be seen as being 
probably cooler than we really are or smarter than we really are. Like everyone wants to be seen as better, their con perfect controlled version. And one thing I've learned, especially in 12-step meetings, is like one of the things that's one of the greatest forms of service is being your honest self. Because by being your honest self, you empower other people to look at themselves honestly. You know, like in the, the world of hiding, the world of like rappers pretending to be tougher than they are or indie rockers pretending to be cooler than they are or social media influencers pretending to be like younger and sexier than they are. Like that world of pretending, it's not it's not helping anybody, you know, like and I really feel like the time has come for people to like step up and be courageous and be honest. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I wonder even if it's masking the pain, you know, just like alcohol. Oh, absolutely. It's like masking the pain and the pretend is masking the pain and like that coming out, that communication that not. And I feel like it is happening on social. You know, I feel like the flip side of that coin and, you know, that collective pain is being addressed. And I feel like the more that we address it, communicate like, you know, and a lot of people like even when it comes to ageism or saying, you know, don't be afraid to say your age when usually it's like, OK, don't tell anyone how old you are, you know, and I think that, you know, you know, in body positivity, like all these uh, movements are coming. Um, and I feel like the more that we talk about them and lift them up and, and, you know, create space for them, the better. So thank you so much for just like just really hitting on those not so easy topics, because I do feel like it's easy to like glaze over and just talk about the highlights. But we're talking about heavy things that I feel like everyone listening is going to reflect on the life and say, wow, you know, um, where do I where do I feel like I stand on this? On, on this topic. So what do you feel like you want to leave people with, you know, um, to ponder um, when it comes to, you know, the well-being of, of themselves and the planet? What a great question, but also what a gigantic question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's that it's hard because we live in a time of just this hyper overstimulation. Um, you know, again, through social media, through caffeine, through sugar, through media, through all, you know, this is this time of like intense hyper stimulation. And we're also bombarded with external stuff that I feel like it's almost like people have like lost the bandwidth as we keep alluding to, like they've lost the bandwidth to look at themselves in like an honest, vulnerable way. Like, Oftentimes when someone like when people look at themselves, they're looking at themselves as these attacked, beleaguered, overstimulated people. And like, that's not even who they are. That's just as that's how they exist in this insane world. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think there's the, the question for everybody is, you know, it, OK. It makes me think of an AA meeting I went to years ago, and this one guy was talking, and he was this tough hipster, was in lower Manhattan, and he was super cool, and his whole, he was talking, and he was basically bragging, and he was such a jerk, and I remember thinking to myself, like, who is this jerk, and he stopped himself, and he said, you know what, I'm just, he said, I'm bragging, and I'm lying. And he said, and he said, I'm so ashamed right now. He said, I don't know what's wrong with me that I can't be honest and vulnerable in front of you people. And he got kind of choked up. And he said, all I have to say to you, he said, do more of what works, do less of what doesn't. Mm. And that struck his vulnerability and like the, the sincerity and the honesty of that, do more of what works, do less of what doesn't. I was like, it's so simple. But then the question is, are we willing to examine and really figure out what works and what doesn't like to like in our relationships, in our health, in our spirituality, like if it's not working, we have to be willing to accept that things aren't working. And sometimes that means making uncomfortable choices and, you know, 
doing things differently, even like whether it's around diet or exercise or spirituality or relationships or family or friends, like moving to a place of like vulnerability, honesty, and sincerity. Mm, I love that. That's amazing. I, I think that is just, it's so good. And it, and it's not easy, you know, but I think that we all get the opportunity to figure it out. And, and if there is no judgment and if there is no shame, as you mentioned earlier, um, then we can all just hold space for people figuring it out, you know, whenever, whenever they can and, and continuing to, um, to share, to share the love and, and to share the compassion. So thank you so much. I think that was really, I think a lot of people are going to resonate with that. And um, wow. I want you to kind of share like um, your book, because I know you just um, put out a book and I want you to just share what inspired you to write the book and also what's your favorite recipe in the book. Um, yeah. So as mentioned, I, so I owned this restaurant, Little Pine, and I no longer own it, but we just released the Little Pine cookbook. And uh, as I try to do, you know, as I did with Little Pine, as I did with Teeny years ago, I, as I try to do with a lot of the things I'm working on, the money that comes in goes to charity. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. I don't like, I guess I've been very fortunate in that I've made enough money so that I can live. You know, I, I lead a pretty simple life. So what I work on, I try to use to benefit the organ benefit organizations, uh, draw attention to issues. So the idea with the cookbook is to represent veganism, um, but also to generate revenue for the charities that I work with. And in terms of a favorite recipe, it's hard to say. Some of the recipes, I'll be fair, some of the recipes are pretty complicated. And if I tried to make them at home, I don't think I could. Uh, <laughs> but I'm also ironically not a great cook um so i'm sure that anybody listening would have much better success with some of these complicated recipes but uh boy favorite recipe you know what i think maybe it's just because i'm a little bit hungry right now but it's the chocolate chip cookie recipe like it's it's completely indulgent and generally, I eat this like very organic, whole foods, healthy diet. These chocolate chip cookies are not healthy. <laughs> They're just like indulgent, hedonistic. But boy, <laughs> if you're going to indulge, these are, these are worth it. Like I'd almost feel like if you have a sweet tooth, be, be warned because these things are pretty dangerous. Wow. I love that. And it just goes back to what we were talking about. It's not about perfectionism. It's about, you know, lifestyle and really choosing a lifestyle um, that works for you and that, you know, and get loved up. We want something that's healthy for you, others and the planet, you know, but allowing yourself this opportunity to to indulge, you know, hopefully your indulgence is not harming animals or the planet. But thank you yeah. so, so much for is there anything else you want to share before um, we sign out? No, this is wonderful. I'm really, really grateful that you asked me to, to come on and and. Yeah, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. And thank you viewers so much for tuning in again. If you haven't already, please leave us a review. I love reading the reviews. And also, if you had a takeaway, I mean, there are so many golden nuggets in this conversation. Please tag Moe, tag me, share your biggest takeaways from this episode. And if you haven't gotten it already, the Little Pine book is out. I know I want to try those chocolate chip cookies, so I'm going to try my hand at it. I'm all about simple recipes, but I can get a little fancy in the kitchen every now and then. So I'm, <laughs> going to try, I'm going to try out that chocolate chip cookie recipe. And you all, until next time, love yourself, love others, and love the world one day at a time, one breath at a time. Peace and love. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being part of the Get Loved Up community. I like to share topics and people making a positive impact in the world, and your feedback means the world to me. If you haven't already left a review, please leave a five-star review and let me know what you want to hear more of on the show. I'm here for you, and together, we're making the world a better place, one day at a time, one show at a time. Thank you for listening.